Cubase 13 has just landed with a bunch of new features and amazing improvements. My name is Hege Davidov and I'll be your host for this expedition. Now the way we're going to do this is compare Cubase 12 to 13 in order to see the differences between the two and there are plenty of these to go around. Let's go. The first thing you might notice is a fresh new user interface. The first bonus Windows users will appreciate is the fact that we finally got rid of the floating menu bar on top of the desktop. Remember that? Since all Cubase main windows are now fully and independently dockable, since Cubase utilizes Windows compliant multi-handling. And as far as I'm concerned, this is very good news indeed. And in general, you can see that the graphics are sharper and the icons slicker. If we have a look at Cubase 12, you can see the differences for yourself. Like notice the icons here, they are not unified. What I mean by that, if you go to the track view here, you can open the instruments pushing this button here, the edit instrument button, and it looks like this. And here it looks like the total opposite, right? It's not unified. In Cubase 13, Steinberg undoubtedly worked overtime, making sure that everything is unified across the board from the mix console through the different editing screens so we can have a battery smooth user experience. And I appreciate that. Here in the track inspector, the routing of the channel now has an honorable tab of its own. And there are several reasons for that. One reason is that you can now see the track MIDI input and output, whether it's a sampler, MIDI or an instrument track. This allows you to see where it comes from and where it goes, not only on the MIDI domain, but now also at the audio level as well. Up until now, we couldn't tell by looking at the inspector where the audio was routed to, unless we opened the edit channel settings and had a look at this, or the mix console in the routing tab. So having it show in the inspector now as well is very nice. Another new feature is something we didn't have before, and it is called Channel View. And you can activate it by pushing this button here. And after one week of working with this new version, I found it to be very useful. Sometimes we jump around the different tabs in the inspector and lose sight of the basic useful function we almost always need in hand, mainly the audio stuff, like the inserts, channel strip, sends, volume pan, and so on. It's not that you can't have this function in the inspector. You can also right click here, choose the setup sections, which also got a facelift, and activate the inserts, EQ sense, and whatever. But again, having them separately available here is very, very useful. In this tab here, we have a thumbnail of the instrument that opens and closes the instrument UI. If I click the name here, it opens the instrument list, and I can choose from the different instruments which is a neat little extension. Also notice that if I click the EQ, it now includes the press section in the display. Let me remind you that in Cubase 12, if you go into the EQ in the mix console, what you get is a borderless floating window with no button knobs or the press section at all. Cubase 13 maintains the same view in the mix console as well. It's all part of a unified experience philosophy, which keeps everything consistent, no matter where you are. Another small but amazing feature is the fact that we now get access to the tap tempo built into the transfer panel. You see this? Before, we had to go into the project menu and choose beat calculator, which looks totally outdated. Looking at this, I can just tap it. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Oh, and it feeds the tempo directly in here. This is one of those features that, until you have it, you don't realize why it wasn't there before. It's that good. Let me open up a tempo track, because you can also use this function to directly feed the tempo track, which apparently is already here. So let's say I stand on bar 23, and I tap tempo like this. One, two, three. Wait for half a second and a breakpoint appears. And I come here and let's do it slower. One, two, three, four. And voila. 
This is a very welcome and much needed addition indeed. Onwards. All the video track lovers out there might be happy to hear that now we have track versions for the video track as well, which can be very useful if you get, you know, like a last minute edit. Not that it happens in real life, of course. You can either open a new project or save a new CPR, but in this current version, I can just drag the new video into a new track version, like this, new version. And in this new version, by the way, you also have these neat buttons here, which can add versions or delete versions and duplicate versions. Put a new edit here, and by using that same ID, change the whole project on the fly. This is a very welcome addition indeed. Speaking of video in Cubase, Steinberg says that Cubase 13 has a new video engine with GPU hardware decoding for H.264, correct colors, consistent handling of different aspect ratios, and improved stability and performance. Why not? Now let's move on to one of the most significant changes in Cubase audio capabilities. Let me just right click here. Let's say I open an audio track. I can now feed audio directly, not only from hardware, but also from software inputts. Like I can route the audio from a group directly into this audio track or from the effects channel tracks or from track instruments themselves. Let's try this. I create an audio track which, by the way, can now be switched from mono to stereo. Yes, it is a button. It's not just an icon anymore. And I will feed it from, let's say, let's go to the routing tab. Your input bus is, let me just create something specifically for that. XO, gotta love XO. This is one of the best ROM plugins ever. Buy it as soon as possible. Let's uh, put it on solo here, and this one I'll put on record. And we don't need the record button on the MIDI. We need the record button on the audio. And the bus is EXO. And let's record EXO directly into an audio track. You can now connect things in new, previously impossible, modular ways. Speaking of MIDI, there's another feature worth mentioning. So here's the controller lane, and let's say I'm without snap. I'm drawing a curve. Look what happens when I leave the mouse button. It automatically reduces all the unnecessary cluttered breakpoints and just leave the bare minimum I really need, which makes editing this graph much easier. Cubis users might recognize this feature from the automation panel in the settings bar. We also had the reduction level for the automation. By the way, while we are on the topic, notice that the panning controller data now uses different values than the old minus 64 to 64 scale. Just draw a curve, it's been reduced. And if you choose a breakpoint, you can see here that we are now dealing with minus 100 to 100 with three decibel points, which basically means that Cubis now fully supports the MIDI 2.0 protocol. Admittedly, there aren't many keyboards using this standard on the market right now, but when there will be, Cubis will be more than happy to support it. And as usual, Steinbeck is always ahead of the curve when it comes to adopting new technologies. So now we've covered all the general new features, if I can call them that, and I'll move on to one of my favorite Cubis features ever the chord pads in the lower zone. But notice the difference. Here's Cubase 12 chord pads, and here's Cubase 13 chord pads again. It seems like every aspect of this feature has been redesigned, while Cubase 12 has a cluttered interface with esoteric buttons and menus scattered around. The new design is really streamlined and inviting. We have a top menu here, with all the general functions and a secondary one with all the pad related functions. Here you can choose the root note, presets, player type, player mode settings, etc. And set up pad related functions from down here. Once I choose a pad, all these functions light up. Now I won't delve into every nook and cranny of the chord pads right now, it's a deep feature that deserves its own video. In fact, I made one a couple of years ago that was quite mind blowing. Here's the link, and I'll add it to the video description as well. 
make sure to watch it. It uses motion control along with the chord pads and it's frankly quite impressive. But I will make a new video on the new chord pads soon. For now, I'll just list the improvements they've made. So besides the great new GUI, you can select multiple pads if you hold the shift button. This was previously impossible in Cubase 12. And you also get the right zone here, which gives you access to the chord editor. You can just select the chord and change the chord on the fly. I can also directly feed the chord as a text. B flat major seven flat five. And here you have it. You can also view the chords as a list, starting from the more ear-friendly green chords down to the spicier red chords down here. And of course, we can also get the circle of fifths. Another cool feature is the display of Roman numerals as a secondary display to the main chord titles. You can also choose to use Nashville number system if you use that, but I'll just leave the Roman numerals. This could be very useful for those more accustomed to thinking in degrees, like jazz musicians. In the end, these well thought out workflow improvements are everything. Moving on to another lower zone great feature is the sampler control, which is already great, but now it's even better. Let's choose a sample or maybe even use the new sample set, which is quite nice. There's the R&B soulful vocal pack here. I'm hooked, I'm hooked on. I'm hooked, I'm hooked on. Okay, let's just drop it into the sample control. Close this window here, lower the volume and choose a part I want to work with. Let's take this one here. Let's loop it. And go straight into the new algorithms. We now have three new algorithms. We used to have it on the music and the solo. Now we have the spectral, spectral HD and spectral vocal. According to Steinberg, these three new algorithms were borrowed from spectral layers. So if I choose spectral, this one can really freeze up time. It kind of reminds me of the spectral oscillator in patch up, but it's not the same algorithm. Very impressive. Now, if you want to know the difference between the spectral and the spectral HD, just open the performance view. And here's the difference. Spectral HD seems to consume a lot more resources out of the CPU. But maybe in turns give a better quality. So, and then we also have the spectral vocal, which seems to be fine tuned to vocal material. This is great. So, th this is one big improvement, but. Let's go to the modulation envelopes. Doesn't matter if it's a volume envelope, the filter envelope, or the pitch envelope. All of these envelopes now have the following tools. Here in Cubase 12, let me just go into the volume envelope. There's nothing here. This is amazing how this simple thing can give new life to the sampler track. Of course, I can just draw, you know, like regular lines the old way by double clicking and double clicking again to erase it, but it's cumbersome. Now we have a pencil tool, which can do all sorts of curves and an eraser. Where have you been in my life? But the amazing part is we also have the paintbrush tool, which can do repetitive tasks and watch this. We got built in curves in the style of effects modulator. If you remember Cubase effect modulator that showed up in Cubase 12, which is a great multi-effect. It came with the module with all sorts of built-in curves. Now Steinberg took this curve and made them available here, along with many others. And we can do all sorts of fancy LFO style effects. Let's start the audio from here. Let's go take this tool and fine tune the curves themselves. Let's 
like built-in trans gate or some fancy type of LFO. This is another example of taking a good thing and making it wow. I use a sampler track all the time. And before I leave, if you messed up a curve, you can undo it, redo it, independently of the general undo redo history of the project. Moving onward, let's check the mix console. If I compare it to Cubase 12, it looks like this. So besides the new look and feel and the new caps, you've got the naming on top of the mixer as well, which is very useful because you don't have to chase the channel all the way down just to understand what you're working on. You have a pop-up windows for the channel strip, which makes the display less cluttered. It's look like a 500 module from a Euro rack, right? And again, it also appears like that in the channel view here. If I choose the strip and open a tool, it pops up to a separate window, going back to the console. The channel tab icon now appears on the bottom, which also might be useful. Here are instrument track icons, audio track icons. Again, the EQ section displays all of the controls. And one hidden feature, remember the times when you used to scroll up and down the mixer and accidentally change parameters while you were at it? So now it won't happen because you can go into the preferences, editing, project and mix console, and make sure that this function is on. Because if it's off, this is what used to happen. When you roll your mouse, I'm trying to scroll up and down. If I'm accidentally floating above a parameter, it changes. And you might not even notice that you've done that. So it was quite a mess. I'm glad they thought about it. So that's about the mix console. Let's move on to another very important update to the key command dialog box. In the old days, which was like yesterday, you have to choose the command on the left side and the key command from the right side and then assign it. And, you know, we got used to it, but looking at it now, it's quite clumsy. Looking at the new interface, choose the command you want and click here. And you can delete it, going back to the default key command, if there is such, and add more than one key command. And you can also filter out the key commands by seeing all of them, or only the assigned ones, or the customized ones, which I've changed, or the ones that are unassigned. And the presets are here. And same thing goes for the macros down here. You can now give them key commands directly from here and you don't have to go to the upper menu searching for the macro tab which as you can see takes too much time and again well thought out feature another new addition comes to the import tracks from project and we've got a new right section here for the range selection which basically means you can not only import tracks from project but select where you want to import them to, between a very specific location. You don't have to import the complete track anymore. Another new thing is that you can import existing tracks and decide what to do with all material in the case your destination track is the same track. You can replace all events in the parts, add events in new parts, and even create new track versions, which is great. So if I compare it to the old design, you can see that the range selection is not available here, and they move things a little bit. Like the import position is now on the upper section here, and here it's on the lower section. And there's a new nice function which can import the position of the new tracks above the selected tracks or below the selected tracks, which is a nice thing to have. And that's about it for this feature. Another thing I really like is the new UI for all of the MIDI inserts. I'm a huge fan of MIDI inserts. I like the way they can manipulate your data and do new stuff. And each and every one of them got a new facelift, a new UI. Here is our, our patch 5 looks in Cubase 13. And here is how it used to look in Cubase 12 downwards. More condensed, a little bit cluttered. Let's just have a look at another one, like Beat Designer, which is a very prominent MIDI insert, completely redesigned. Steinbeck also mentioned that they discontinued the track control MIDI insert. I personally never used that, so I don't think I'll miss it, but maybe it's something you should know about. 
a very well thought up addition is this green line here, which you can drag to different places. When I put it under the insert, hit record, it will record the drums directly into the MIDI part. In the old versions of Cubase, you have to select the MIDI insert and push the record button and then record. And some of the plugins use a different method and you have to go to the MIDI menu and freeze MIDI modifiers or whatever. Moving onward to the more serious features, you can now see that we have the visibility pane on the left, which is again, part of the philosophy of keeping everything unified. It looks more like a, a project window now, right? So you don't have to jump between the different windows. I can choose the track I want to work on like this. I can make them visible from here. I can even solo only the active parts. So I don't have to go outside and solo and unsolo and mute and unmute and whatever. And you can also see that I don't really know where I have MIDI data in the parts and where it is and where it isn't. Here comes another new feature. If I push this button here, I can add the tracks view. And the tracks view give me an overview of all the tracks I've got. You can even open track lanes from here, which is amazing. So let me just put it like this and focus on this part, which I can clearly see there's information here. great feature. Another nice thing we have here now is the ability to range select. This offers several benefits. I can select this region here and then move to the pencil and it's all highlighted and vice versa. And once I do, I can be sure that I've selected all the notes above what I see and below what I see, which takes up the guesswork, you know, from the editing process. And if I use Alt and the down arrow, I can also choose the control lane data as well. Let's just add another lane here. And again, I will highlight this section and Alt downward arrow. I can select the control lane data as well. Let's just say I select this data. I can just push full vertical and full vertical here in the info line was make sure that I choose all the relevant MIDI data, even the lanes that are not currently displayed. And another new cool thing I've noticed that if I choose this node with the range selection, push control alt and down arrow, it duplicates it, which is nice. And if I've chosen the MIDI data as well, alt arrow down and then control alt arrow down, it duplicates it as well. Very nice touch. Let's erase all the data here and move on to the step MIDI input. You can now push a note and hold it. And with the right key, make it longer. And if I undo, notice that the cursor of the step MIDI input also jump to the correct position. And now, if I want to rewrite a section using the MIDI input, in the past you can only change the actual notes you've played or the velocity, but I cannot input a chord if I wanted to. So now I can do that. This is a very nice addition. Now let's move on, talk about the new plugins that comes with Cubase that was already packed, right? I think that one of the main advantages of Cubase is a DAW that comes with so many quality plugins these days that I rarely outsource any third party plugins unless it's very special in what it does because all the bread and butter effects that come with Cubase are simply great. So here's the list of what's new without the fine details. One that impressed me the most, I think, is the vocal chain, which is not just an effect, it's a multi-effect. It takes care of all of your vocal needs. 
with a cut filter, gate, pitch, you see whatever I choose here, change the display in the lower section, and we can set it up any way we want, and it only costs us one insert. We also have the EQP1A, which needs no introduction. It's modeled after the famous Pultec EQP1A program equalizer, with the only difference being the variable frequency. See? Same goes for its little brother, the EQM5, which is a mid-range program EQ by Pultec. Again, with variable frequencies as opposed to the original fixed frequencies. We have the black valve, which seems to be sort of a preamp combined with a drive and a compressor or peak limiter, probably modeled after some piece of gear from Universal Audio by the looks of it from the LA family. Next up is the Vox Comp, which, as the name suggests, is a vocal compressor. It's supposed to be a gentle compression. And we have an updated test generator. Oop. Which comes with sweeps. You can choose the timing of the sweeps here. It also comes with new noise shapes. White, pink, brown, blue, gray, violet. I didn't even know such a thing exists. And another, not exactly a plugin, right? If I go into Spectre Layers, you can see the overall redesign of the plugin. It's now in version 10. Of course, with Cubase, you get Spectre Layers 1, not the fully fledged product, which you can buy as a standalone. Steinberg now claims that unmixed vocals uses an AI powered algorithm that leads to better vocal separation. Seeing the word AI within Cubase might suggest new technologies that are down the pipeline, and this alone gets me very excited. Last but not least, let's talk about the content that comes with Cubase as well. And the major one is within Helion Sonic, which is a mini version of Helion. In the past, they used to like Helion, a user interface a lot, but the sound that came with it left much to be desired. But I have to say that in the recent version of Cubase, and of course in Cubase 13 even more, you get quality sounds out of the box. The latest and greatest supplement is Iconica Sketch, product that originally built by orchestral tools for Steinberg and contains cut down version of the original product. It sounds very good out of the box. Why do I hear a bass with my bassoon? Why do I hear a bass instead of a bassoon? God damn it! Where is it coming from? Ah, oh, it's the bass guitar. Pardon me. Here it is. And I always test virtual orchestral instruments by using the legato and testing the transition there. And it uses a very small, you know, RAM footprint as well. So for orchestration on the fly, advanced sketches, sounds great. Let's hear the horn. Let me just type in horn. And let's take the solo horn. Let's check the dynamic range. It's nice. To have these sounds available right out of the box is a great selling point for newcomers. Loops and samples. And the new ones are the one we've mentioned before, the soulful R&B vocals, the cinematic electronics, the midnight dance, the analog wonder. And there's supposed to be somewhere here one that's called Beat Butcher, but I don't see it. Maybe I haven't installed it or something, I don't know. And that's it for my take on Cubase 13. And my conclusions are that this is a very well thought up and deep update. And I'm a very happy camper here. But I'm always thrilled to see the ideas they come up with and the way they implement it. I highly recommend this update. And if you have any more questions, feel free to like, comment, and of course subscribe so you don't miss any further videos. And I will make more deep videos about the separate Cubase feature. This was just an overview. And if you have any certain topic you want me to cover, of course, leave it in the comments below. And I'll see you in the next video.